Welcome to the final session of the 2023 Words, Ideas, and Thinkers Festival. Please silence your phones. I'm Megan Marshall, the author of three biographies, a past president of the Society of American Historians and professor of nonfiction writing in the MFA program at Emerson College. And I've been a member of the Authors Guild since 1985. Those three books took a while to write. <laughs> I want to first thank our wonderful sponsors, the Cromwell Harbor Foundation, Joanne Leonhardt Casulo, Hunter Runette and Mark Vandenbosch, Taryn and Mark Levitt, Hans and Kate Morris, Diana Rowan Rockefeller, Amy Davidson Sorkin and David Sorkin, Marie Arana and Jonathan Yardley, Berkshire Takana Community Foundation, Merdad and Marilee Narani, October Mountain Financial Advisors, and Louise Hartwell White. Yes. It's appropriate that the WIT Festival should conclude with a conversation between two eminent literary personalities known in different ways for their wit. I'm a friend of Stacy Schiff, and I can testify that in private conversation, Stacy is every bit as witty and quick-witted as the narrator on each page of her five biographies, plus her bewitching narrative of the hysteria in Salem back in the 17th century. And it can only be said that Marty Baron is the perfect exemplar of a man who lives by his wits in the best sense of that phrase. It takes a kind of smarts that few people possess to have led three of the nation's great newspapers through the past two decades of disruption in the industry and in the world at large, racking up Pulitzers along the way. And Marty has a sly sense of humor, too, I learned in talking recently to some of his former staffers at the Boston Globe, all of whom miss him greatly. One remembered Marty's quip to Dean Baquet, executive editor of the New York Times back in 2017, after Marty had taken over the top job at the Washington Post. Baquet was ribbing Barron for the choice of democracy dies in darkness as the Post's new motto. Baquet said, I actually think their slogan, Marty Barron, please forgive me for saying this, sounds like the next Batman movie. <laughs> Marty answered, no apology necessary from the people of Gotham. Democracy dies in darkness may be a useful starting point for the conversation we're about to hear. In her newest biography, The Revolutionary, Samuel Adams, Stacey Schiff shows how democracy rose in the Enlightenment, a time when a man of powerfully held, enlightened, we might say, ideals, could manipulate public opinion to positive effect, helping to bring on the revolution that gave birth to our seemingly sturdy republic. On the far end of the arc of history that began with the Declaration of Independence, we have Marty Barron holding the reins of a national newspaper that cataloged the over 30,000 lies issued by our last president during his term in office, lies that were believed by a huge swath of the American electorate. Has darkness fallen? Well, You've probably read the bios of Stacey Schiff and Marty Barron on the festival website, but just a few highlights from their careers before we begin. Stacey Schiff's first biography, Saint Exupery, published in 1994, was a Pulitzer finalist, and her second, Vera, Mrs. Vladimir Nabokov, won the Pulitzer Prize in 2000. A great improvisation, Franklin, France, and the Birth of America, won the George Washington Book Prize, and Cleopatra, A Life, was a number one bestseller. The Witches topped the bestseller list, too, and it's my favorite. The revolutionary Samuel Adams was on President Obama's list of favorite books in 2022. Marty Barron's book, Collision of Power, Trump, Bezos, and the Washington Post, will be published on October 3rd, so look for it. 
That's what he's been working on since he retired in February 2021 after eight years as executive editor of the Washington Post. News staffs under his leadership have won 18 Pulitzer Prizes, including for the Post's coverage of the January 6, 2021 assault on the Capitol. While he was the top editor of the Boston Globe, the paper won six Pulitzer Prizes, including for its investigation into the Catholic Church's concealment of clergy sex abuse. That coverage was portrayed in the Academy Award-winning movie Spotlight, which I think everybody here has seen. They think they know Marty already, perhaps. Under his leadership, the Miami Herald won the Pulitzer Prize for reporting on the raid to recover Elian Gonzalez, the Cuban boy at the center of a fierce immigration and custody dispute. So now please welcome Stacy, Marty, and Lynn Bolger to moderate. Well, thank you all for being here. This is going to be one of the most terrifying assignments of my life as the at, at, um, executive editor, I mean, executive director, see what I mean, of the Authors Guild Foundation. But last fall, um, I was reading Stacy's biography of um, Samuel Adams and texting her saying, how do you know this? How did you figure this out? Why, how did you know it was snowing on this day in Boston? And meanwhile, over the airwaves, the January 6th hearings were going on and it was impossible not to notice the same sort of language and words popping up in the book and on NPR and um, in my newsfeed patriots, tyranny, freedom. And what do they say? History does not repeat itself, but it rhymes. And so as we were, as I was sort of steeped in both of these things, this palimpsest of history, our wonderful WIT committee was working to put this series together. And Wendy Strothman, right here, hi, um, said to me, well, Marty Barron has a book. We have to scoop it. He, it's coming out in October, October, and it will be right before, and it's called Collision of Power, as um, Megan just said. And I thought, aha. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to read this because this is okay. Um, Marty's book, a monumental work of nonfiction that gives a first row seat to the epic power struggle between politics, money, and media. And I thought, there is so much to explore between these two books. Power, how governments are undermined, the power of journalism, the power of fake news, the work of the biographer, the historian, the journalist writing about events now and in that happened in the past, how the public gets manipulated by fear and anger. So I wanted to welcome you both and thank you for being here. And I will start with Stacy and ask what led you to write the revolutionary Samuel Adams? Um, let me just start by saying thank you all for sticking around until the bitter end. Um, and thank you to the Authors Guild for a spectacular festival and to this marvelous theater. It's really stellar. Um, and to Lynn for putting me on stage with the intimidating um, Marty Baron, um, the greatest editor of his generation, as anyone will tell you. And I just want to say about Megan, um, thank you for the introduction, Megan. Megan has a private theory, which I'm glad she didn't share, which is that I have spent the last 10 years of my life writing about colonial Massachusetts as a way of worming myself back to the Berkshires <laughs> and where I was born. And um, today she seems to have proved her point. So I'm thrilled to be here. And it was easier to do that than to write a memoir, that I would say. Um, and, I, and the answer to your question, which we can talk about later, is I knew it was snowing that day because I read the newspaper, which seems apt, right? Um, for whatever day in 1765 that was. Um, I had spent a lot of time in um, 1692 Salem for the previous book, which was about the witch trials. And I was desperate for something um, that was a little bit um, sunnier, for lack of a better word. Um, it's a pretty dispiriting years. It's a real miscarriage of justice. It's, a, it's, a, it's nine months in which very few people come off well and where it's really hard to actually find a hero. And, and, but the one hero of the day 
was someone who in a very indirect way very much reminded me of Samuel Adams, a personage I knew relatively little about, but whom I had written in a sort of walk-on role into a previous book on Benjamin Franklin. And in that book, I had sort of settled for the sort of, you know, clausal definition of Samuel Adams as, you know, the, the firebrand of the revolution. I don't think those were my words, but they were pretty trite. Um, and I started reading his papers. And as soon as you start reading the papers of Samuel Adams, if you're a half sane person, which I clearly was, um, you've really fall under their spell because they are um, very much the essence of republicanism and of what we have, have come to think of as our founding ideals. And they, they hadn't really been written about terribly well or very often. And when you read the 18th century contemporaries of Adams, all of them pointed to him um, as, along with George Washington, the prime mover of the revolution. And so really that book was, to a large extent, an answer to the question, what did those founders know that we have forgotten? Because they held Adams in such high esteem. And Marty, I'm going to turn to you and say, this is your first book that's coming out on October 3rd, which by the way, you can pre-order in the lobby and the bookstore in Lenox already has the copies of the book, so you will not have to wait long. This ad brought to you by, um, please tell us how you decided to retire, but then write this huge book. Uh, sure, sure. Um, well thanks, and thanks for, let me echo uh, Stacy's remarks, uh, thanking uh, you for this program, it's great. And um, I live here in the Berkshires, and so thank you to the entire Berkshire community for creating a very welcoming environment for someone like me to live. So, um, uh, let's see. Uh, I won't get to the retirement just yet, uh, but as far as the book is concerned, uh, which deals with why I actually decided to retire, um, um, I uh, decided to write this book because I was really at the center of American history in an incredibly important moment in the history of the American press. So I arrived at the, at the Washington Post at the beginning of 2013. The paper at the time was owned by the Graham family, which had owned the, the Washington Post for uh, eight decades. Um, and uh, seven months after I arrived, uh, they decided to sell it. Uh, it's not something that I expected uh, when I was hired. Uh, after all, the parent company was called the Washington Post Company. So, um, and then it was sold, of course, to one of the richest people in the world, founder of Amazon. Um, and I didn't know what to expect. Um, and then along comes uh, Donald Trump uh, onto the polit political landscape and, uh, in 2015. And uh, we really did have sort of a clash of, of powers. So the Washington Post is a newspaper that was best known for Watergate and helping to bring down a previous president. Um, uh, again, one of the richest people in the world and a, a leader in, in technology and with no one really knowing uh, what he wanted to do with the Post. Um, and how he would deal with the pressures from politicians. Uh, and then Trump, a president unlike any other that we've ever seen. Uh, I think I can say that safely. Um, and, and so um, I thought I should write about what, how we dealt with that in the press. I don't think the press has ever had to deal with that before. We were dealing with that in the nation's capital. And, um, and a lot of people didn't know what was happening about the decisions that we made, why we made the decisions we did. Um, and during my time there, I couldn't talk about a lot of that. Uh, I couldn't talk a lot about our internal editorial processes. We had a policy against that. Um, and uh, some of the controversies that arose in our newsroom, which were uh, part of the reason that I decided to retire, um, were other than being age 66, uh, but part of the reason. Uh, I couldn't talk about those either because those were personnel, uh, personnel matters. Uh, but, you know, we do have this uh, motto at the Washington Post, democracy dies in darkness. So I thought it might be appropriate to shed some light on what happened inside our organization. Uh, we are a big part of democracy. I think it's apparent from Stacy's book uh, that the press plays an enormous role um, in, uh, in our democracy. And, um, and it still does. And, um, and the Washington Post plays a central role. And so I wanted to talk about that and explain what it is. I don't expect everybody to agree with the decisions that I made, uh, but I would like them to understand why I made those decisions. Thank you. Um, I am going to read the, the um, New York Times, the f first paragraph of the review. I think there was more than one, actually, of Stacy's book. Um, and that is, it was in the... Um, 
oh, sorry, I can't remember the name of the reviewer, but what do you call an anti-tax ideologue who spreads false accounts of rape and child murder via the mass media with the explicit goal of bringing down a legitimately constituted government? If the man is Samuel Adams, you call him a founder. <laughs> and I wanted you to comment. <laughs> of course you did, I yes. Did. <laughs> um, well, let me just hold on to the legitimately elected government for one second there. But um, to go back half a step, um, Adams, in his, fresh out of his Harvard years and having really no profession to his name, helps to found a newspaper. And... That newspaper had a very short run. He found out that newspapering was actually a very taxing profession. Um, and it was called The Independent Advertiser, and it was basically 11 months between 1747 and, uh, sorry, 1747 and 1748. And the initial run of that newspaper, the initial, the sort of first issue mission statement, so to speak, was the idea, it wasn't gonna be a, a newspaper that had any political stance of any kind, its role was simply to um, remind the people of the colonies of their rights and privileges and to help them to uh, make sure that they rescue those from any potential infringements or encroachments, which is basically democracy dies in darkness, right? Mm -hmm. um, in its earliest form. Um, Adams then goes on to become under at least 30 pseudonyms, um, a constant editorial writer, constant newspaper writer in Boston between the time of the Stamp Act and the time of the Revolution. And at several junctures along the way, he um, very creatively helps to found, for example, a new sort of syndicate which will send pieces about occupied Boston. Um, troops arrive in Boston in 1768 to, to calm this very restive town. And Adams and his associates will write up very um, exaggerated, sensationalized accounts of what has happened between civilians and soldiers and essentially circulate those throughout the colonies so as to drum up a great deal of sympathy for poor martyred Boston. And that's an act he'll continue um, several times over and most notably probably um, in the wake of the Boston Massacre when as many of you know, the soldiers are largely exonerated for having shot at and in some cases murdered civilians and after they are exonerated, Adams spends six months in the press essentially re-adjudicating the case. Um, which is ironic because his cousin John, of course, had arranged for the defense of the soldiers, and here's Adams in the paper um, essentially saying this was a terrible miscarriage of justice and giving all of the evidence from the bloody bayonets to the, to the witnesses who shouldn't have been believed as to why this is a terrible miscarriage of justice. And just to give one little bit of his flavor, at one point he, there's, a, there's one of the... Um, one of the men murdered that evening actually dies later that night and before dying says that he forgives the soldier who shot him because the, sol the British soldiers had been provoked by the civilians. And Adams goes back to this deathbed, this deathbed exoneration and basically says, you know, he was laboring under a mortal wound. How can we, how can we believe what he said? And moreover, he didn't say that under oath. And also his landlady kind of mentions he's an unsavory character. And also just saying he's a Roman Catholic. So, <laughs> so you know, it's, it, it's pretty, you know, faking new, fake news kind of stuff. Yeah, he right? was the original fake news, right, in the United States. So, yeah, so. On the other hand, in Adams' opinion, this was not a legitimately elected government. This was an arbitrary government imposed from abroad. And that was, at every juncture, the sticking point. Um, I would also just, not that I mean to defend him, but would want to add that we're talking about, these are many years before Walter Lippmann, right? There is no such thing as an objective press anywhere in the world in the 18th century. Um, so so to, judge him by our, to judge any press of those years by our standards is like asking why was there no anesthesia for surgery? I mean, it's just, it's, it, it's a different world completely. And, and he's, we're op operating obviously from a different set of instructions, but yes, these are methods with which we are today familiar and which we today denounce all of them used in the interests of, of great ideals. Yeah, and I think these days, uh, you know, fake news, uh, exaggeration, propaganda, all of that uh, is used for a different purpose, and that is to undermine governments that are legitimately elected uh, and to undermine confidence in institutions that have served us well over, over many decades. And um, there's a, <clears throat> to me, that's a critical distinction between what Adams was doing. I mean, it, 
I, I don't agree with those methods. Those are not methods that we ought to be using today. I think we ought to be uh, using an objective method in, 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 approaching our, uh, in approaching our work in journalism. But um, he was working toward a cause that I think we all can believe in and, and against a government that was really imposed on, on people um, as opposed to one that they selected for themselves in a process of self-governance. Uh, these days, uh, you see a lot of manipulation, exaggeration, hyperbole, outright falsehoods, uh, lies, uh, all of that for the purpose of undermining a legitimately elected uh, president and for undermining confidence in pretty much every institution, uh, and including undermining confidence in mainstream, reliable, uh, largely trusted media organizations. I mean, this comes up a lot with, um, with Adams, just since we're in Western Massachusetts, with Shays' Rebellion, where this man who has been a provocateur and very much um, interested in all kinds of street protest for over a decade before the revolution, when the, the farmers of Western Massachusetts begin to rise in armed protest against taxes in 1786, essentially says they should hang because they are, in this case, trying to unsettle a government in which they participate, and for that, there is a fair alternative, and it is called an election. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, obviously, that's what we have today. Uh, thankfully, still have elections, um, and um, for the most part, that are legitimately um, uh, handled. Uh, that in itself is in question now as to whether our elections will be, um, will, will be handled in a, in a legitimate way and whether people's votes will be, will be suppressed or not. So uh, we have that concern as well. But I think what we saw, for example, on, on January 6th was really um, an effort to um, overturn the results of the election. And, um, and we see that today still, um, where you have a number of media, uh, particularly from the far right, uh, who are still raising questions about that election and causing so many Americans to believe that uh, Joe Biden was not legitimately elected. I want to bring up the... Um the point, too, that there's an echo in Stacy's book and today where the uh, crown, uh, um, Thomas Hutchinson, the government, the governor of Massachusetts, w constantly, repeatedly tried to warn England that these rabble-rousers need to be taken seriously. They are trying to foment rebellion. And they were like, run along. We have other things to worry about. And then waking up um, on the morning of 2016 and realizing Hillary Clinton was not our president, that we were all sort of um, uh, expecting a certain outcome and did not take this man seriously. Marty, do you want to sort of... Well, I, I disagree with the idea that we didn't take him seriously. The, the reality is, for example, at the Washington Post... Um, in, uh, when Trump announced in uh, the summer of 2015, um, immediately after his announcement, particularly with his incendiary comments about Mexicans crossing the border, uh, being rapists and the like, um, uh, to many people's dismay, understandably, uh, he, um, he garnered 30% of support among Republicans right away. He became the leading candidate among Republicans. And, um, and so how could you not take him seriously as a candidate? Uh, I recall when Huffington Post, for example, decided to put him, they said, announced proudly that they were going to put him on the entertainment pages, and they were cheered by a lot of people. I thought that was ridiculous. I mean, anybody who can command the support of 30% of uh, one of the major American parties should be taken seriously. So what did we do? We, we looked deeply into his background, uh, so deeply that we decided to do a book. Um, and it was called Trump Revealed, and it was a very revealing uh, book that we did at the Washington Post about him. And in order to do that book, we enlisted, in addition to the, the, the reporters who were already working on covering Trump, which was a lot, uh, we enlisted another 20 people on the staff to look at every single chapter of his life, uh, to go deep, his life and his, his career. Uh, and we did go very deep. And I think if anybody, anybody goes back and rereads that book, which I did in writing my own book, um, they'll see that it is quite um, discerning as to what kind of a person he is and what kind of a businessman he has been. Um, and uh, so, and when we did that, and it was, became public that we had enlisted another 20 reporters on this, uh, Trump went ballistic about the whole thing um, and accused us of, of basically trying to sub subvert his, his campaign. 
Uh, he attacked us on Fox News and elsewhere, um, attacked Bezos uh, directly uh, because uh, Bob Woodward had made some comments before, oddly enough, a bunch of uh, real estate developers um, that uh, indicating that that Bezos somehow wanted us to be looking hard at, at um, hard at Trump, but if you actually go back and look at Bob's comments, they were very general in the sense that Bezos felt like anybody should that we should do a deep job, a deep investigation of anybody who wants to be president of the United States, and the Post had always done that. In fact, and in Boston we did that. We did a we did an entire book on John Kerry when he was running. We did an entire book on on Mitt Romney when he was when he was running. Uh, and we went very deep, so on both of them. And, um, and so that has been part of the history and tradition of the Washington Post and other news organizations. So, um, but you know, the reality is that people, and, and I think this is addressed in Stacy's book also, is, is the role of emotion in voting as opposed to logic and reason. And so I'd, I'd be interested in what Stacy says about, can talk about that, is that I think a lot of people were voting for Trump, not because of, this chapter in his life, this chapter in his, his business career, this, this offense that he committed, this language that he used, this illogic on his part, or any of that. Uh, they felt that he was speaking for them. In fact, that he was using the kind of language that they would use. Uh, they felt that they had been ignored by the so-called elites, especially the media. Um, and so um, they saw him as a representative of theirs. They weren't, they weren't really voting on the basis of... Um, of reason and logic and evaluating different positions. They were voting on an emotional basis for someone they felt would punch the elites uh, in the face uh, and, and finally deal with people like me. Uh, and so people voted for that. And it was an emotional response. And emotion played a big role with, uh, with Samuel Adams as well. Do you remember that speech that um, Trump gave where he ripped up his speech and said, I'll just wing it? I just had that, that lasting image. It was like ripping up his homework. And that somehow deeply appealed um, across the board. This is a line of Woodrow Wilson's, which I keep thinking about when you say things like that, and I'm going to mutilate it. But it's essentially the fact that you can't reason a man out of an opinion that he didn't reason himself into in the first place. Um, and that, that, I mean, that's exactly it, right? There's just the, 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 gr the sense of grievance, the sense of emotion um, was something that Adams, yes, knew how to manipulate, but he had it in a funny way, um, and you touched on this, Len, he had um, kind of an ace in his, in his pocket because he had um, a sort of disaffection for Thomas Hutchinson, for this actually very diligent, sober, modest, kind public servant who over the previous, who over the sort of 15 years preceding the revolution had managed in Boston to accumulate for himself or for his family pretty much every political office. And therefore, Adams, who is himself born to a very affluent family and educated at Harvard, from which he also has a master's degree, for Hutchinson, Adams is able to, to really drum up a tremendous sort of anti-elitist sentiment, which you know, has a lot of resonance today, in fact, and makes Hutchinson, to me, in a way, a very endearing figure in a book in which I think one is meant, on some levels, really to criticize him. But poor Hutchinson does not see this rise of popular anger against him. He can't understand the disaffection. He has been um, an immensely able and diligent public servant. He doesn't think he should be, pay the price for his years of terrific public service. He doesn't seem to notice things like when the tea is sent to America in 1773 by the East India Company is entrusted to two people who are his relatives, two people who are his sons, and two people who are his friends. These things are just lost on him. And he doesn't understand the, the resentment that is growing around him and around the Crown officers, which Adams is very, very dexterously able to exploit. Yeah, there was a, you had a great line in your book that I, I took some notes on your book. Um, I being was a unable journal, to take notes on Marty's book because it well, is embargoed. You can't embargo. do that yet. So, uh, you know, I always like having the advantage. But um, <laughs> this is only round one, you realize. Uh, right. <laughs> That's what I fear. Um, in any event, um, he, you wrote of, of Adams, he said, he, he knew that we are governed more by our feelings than by reason. With, with rigorous logic, he lunged at the emotions. And I think, what, you know, these days we have a lot of people who say, I just can't understand why people are voting for Trump. Um, well, uh, somebody who lunges at the emotions is Donald Trump. Um, people aren't voting based on logic or reason. Um, they're voting based on emotions. And so I think we need to do a better job of understanding uh, what these emotions are 
and um, what gave rise to these emotions in the first place. And uh, we haven't done a very good job of that. I mean, I think at the, at the Post and at other media organizations, one of our biggest mistakes, frankly, was um, before Trump ever became a candidate, uh, that we were not out sufficiently in the country uh, taking the measure of the grievances that uh, so many people in this country had. Like them, agree with them, disagree with them, whatever. Uh, but they had them. And so we really needed to understand that and understand why that might give rise to a, um, a candidate like, like Donald Trump. When you, um, there were focus groups done uh, when, after Trump announced uh, that looked at, um, that they would basically throw at them every negative thing that Trump had said or done or anything like that. And uh, people were inured to that. They, they didn't react to that at all. Uh, what they did react to is that they, they saw both Jeb Bush who was at one time considered to be the leading candidate, went nowhere, of course. Um, and they, they, didn't like the, they didn't like the Bush family. Uh, they were sick of the Bush family. They saw them as part of sort of a governing elite that hadn't served them well. And they didn't like the Clinton family. They liked them even worse. Uh, and so who was their representative? It was Donald Trump, who was, aunt, who, while a member of the elite, okay, uh, clearly being as wealthy as he is, uh, and having inherited as much money as he did, presented himself to the public as anti-elitist and as someone who would speak for them. And so I think that we in the press and we as a, as a people should do a much better job of trying to understand what are these emotions and uh, what has given rise to these emotions. One of the, um, the, one of the riches for writing, the, the biggest trove of riches for writing um, the Adams book was actually the criticism of Adams that is being drummed up um, in London, where royal governor after royal governor has been sending letters back saying this guy's running circles around us what's going on here can't we get can we arrest him and send him home for to be tried for treason a charge by the way which is in the declaration of independence and it probably applied to and probably because it was pulled out for adams but at one point the solicitor general trying to figure out some way to arrest adams and put everyone out of their misery has a line which reminds me exactly of what you just said which is that um with his publications he has given the people ideas of a thousand grievances they had never felt and a thousand rights of which they had never dreamed. I, I want to point out that the, po the, the remarkable power of these two men, just two men that were able to tap into this vein and, and work the vein of public opinion in such a powerful way. They were changing the narrative. Yeah. I, they were. And I, I was interested, uh, you also indicated in the book that, that um, Adams minimized violence. Um, and I would be interested in your talking about that because we have plenty of people today who are minimizing violence. And um, they feel that the, basically that the ends justify those sorts of means. And um, that's not a new thought. It's one that Adams himself was uh, sympathetic to. There's a, there's a lot of terror and um, intimidation in these years. And one of, Adams had many, many tools in his toolbox, but several of them were boycotts and non-importation agreements. And those merchants in Boston um, who did not sign on for these agreements um, very often had their, their gardens trampled and their windows, a lot of windows were broken in Boston. That was a very good business to have been in in these years. Um, there's a lot of street violence and Adams inevitably writes afterward, you know, this person who complained about the visit by the licorice boys, as he calls them. Well, they weren't licorice boys. They were, you know, stone-wielding men. And again, this is on the side of the angels, but this is indeed intimidation of, of the rawest kind. I mean, there, there are more subtle tactics. I mean, I'm thinking of um, after, the, after the tea sinks into Boston's harbor, um, a committee is appointed to discuss whether the, East Indi whether the town should reimburse the East India Company for the tea. And Adams works very ably to turn that committee into a secret committee which um, in the absence of those members who believe that Boston should actually reimburse the East India Company, instead meets when those men are absent for which Adams arranges so that they can decide on, to meet in Philadelphia for the First Continental Congress. So he essentially just hijacks this, um, this committee and turns it into a different committee. It's almost like an extra, le extra legal assembly, which he will do over and over again through these years. So also not, a, 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 not on the up and up, that tactic. Right. 
you know, uh, this, this idea of threats and intimidation, we've seen a lot of that over the last uh, number of years. Um, we, there's a lot of talk these days about threats uh, against uh, uh, members of the Justice Department, uh, people who are, who are central to the prosecution of Donald Trump on a variety of, on a variety of fronts. Uh, but certainly we in the press have felt that. Um, I talk about that in my book, about the kinds of threats that we faced that I, that I received as well, but that many of the people on our staff received over uh, a period of time, far worse than, worse than I did. Uh, we had to take security measures that we have we never imagined that we would have to take uh, in our news organizations. When I started in the news business, which was 1976, um, really full time, uh, you know, I started in a small place in a small office. Uh, we would like to keep our doors open. The idea was people in the community should be able to come in. They should be able to talk to us, give us their press releases or complain or whatever it is. Try to be as accessible as possible. Uh, but now to get into a newsroom, uh, there's a lot of security, a tremendous amount of security um, and because uh, people are under threat. People were under threat at their homes. Uh, people were under threat walking to work or driving to work. Uh, we were having to consult um, with outside experts about how to protect ourselves. Uh, the amount of, uh, just the amount of money that we had to spend on additional security for people uh, was extraordinary. And it's given us the flavor of what a lot of journalists in other countries are facing on a day-to-day -day basis, far worse than what we face here in the United States. Um, obviously, just below the border, uh, Mexico is one of the most dangerous places for journalists in the world. Um, from, um, could be from uh, people who are trafficking in drugs, obviously, that's the biggest threat, other sorts of criminal gangs, but also government officials who are, al who are aligned with them. And now we're, we face a tremendous number of threats, uh, the press does, from, um, we don't know what quarter. Uh, it could be any one person. After January 6th, I saw uh, a lot of things online um, that said, um, you know, we don't really need to do this in an organized fashion. We can all take autonomous action. Uh, we know where, we know where um, our enemies live, uh, and people should just go after them on their own. Um, and that was probably the first time that I actually had real concern for my own personal safety. Do you write that down to the fact that the rhetoric has got more heated to social media? To I mean, there has always been a, a political division in America. What, what actually contributed to that rise in temperature? A rise in violence, I should say. Well, uh, it starts with Trump. Um, I mean, he's, he's the insider in chief uh, in this country. Uh, he has, um, he's used language that's been violent. He's, he's, uh, A.G. Salzberger, who's currently the publisher of the New York Times, actually visited with him in the White House uh, in expressing concerns about the kind of language that he was using and that it would lead to real risks for, for journalists and that people could be injured and people could be killed. Uh, did Trump stop? He didn't stop. He continued. He doubled down. He tripled down. Um, and all of the people around him, his allies, uh, are doing that as well. Just look at the language that they use. I mean, they use, uh, he's used this from the very beginning. Uh, obviously, garbage and scum and the lowest form of uh, humanity. Um, uh, and then he, he escalated that to uh, enemy of the people. Um, and people respond to that. I mean, it's a lot like the language that was used against the press. I mean, I was, I was really struck, although they were much more literate than, uh, than Trump. And the language that they used, uh, they were, it was much more colorful. And what was this? Here we are. Execrable villains. Oh, yeah, these are great. Um, agonizing reptiles, execrable set of scrawling miserables, uh, people who rave and drivel out their political frenzy and idiotism. Um, you know, all we got from Trump was like garbage, scum, enemy of the people. I mean, uh, it was much more colorful in those days. Uh, but, uh, but I think the language is at least as effective. But, but those words did not incite violence. That's my... Yeah, uh, right. Uh, so uh, Trump's language has, his allies have, people in the media uh, who are aligned with him, uh, I believe, have incited violence. And that, of course, there's a tremendous amount on social media, particularly from white right-wing extremist groups uh, that have encouraged this kind, of, this kind of violence. I mean, look what happened on January 6th. It's not, there was not only an, this attack on the Capitol, an incursion into the Capitol uh, with threats against uh, uh, members of Congress, but look at the scenes of what happened to the press that was outside, simply covering that event, uh, particularly attacks on CNN, um, because CNN had been a particular target of Trump. That brings us to 
the idea that, um, so as a democracy under threat um, and reporting on journalism, how does a paper of record like the Washington Post change when you have somebody like Bezos take it over? How did the editorial slant change, if at, if at all? How, how did that play out under your watch there? Yeah, well, I try not to use the phrase editorial slant, by the way. But um, <laughs> so I actually have written pretty extensively about the need for objective uh, journalism, and I really believe in that. So uh, slant's not in my vocabulary. Um, so. Uh, in any event, when he acquired us, uh, he made clear that he wasn't going to interfere in our journalism whatsoever, and he didn't, uh, and I give him a lot of credit for that. He didn't get involved in deciding what we should publish, what we shouldn't publish, uh, he didn't criticize our stories, he didn't critique the stories, he didn't do any of that. Uh, he was very involved in the business side of the, of, of the news organization in terms of uh, what our overall strategy should be. We shifted immediately from being a paper that was regionally oriented that had really shrunk and was focused on the Washington region, so Maryland, Virginia, the district, um, to being a national news organization and being very digitally oriented. Uh, we had that opportunity because, um, uh, because we live in a digital era. We didn't have to deliver physical newspapers all over the country anymore. Uh, all you needed to do was get another subscriber or reader uh, online. Uh, and that is uh, a lot more, that's a lot less cost costly. So that was a real opportunity for us. And, as he, as he correctly concluded, we had a real advantage in doing that, that we had not sufficiently exploited. And that was that um, we were in the nation's capital, after all. That's a great place to be, to create a national news organization. We had a name, the Washington Post, that could be leveraged to a national level. And we had a history and a heritage um, that, um, that people knew about. Uh, they hadn't necessarily read the Washington Post, but they knew of the Washington Post because of Watergate. And it had an identity as a result of that, which was known as a news organization that uh, holds government to account uh, and holds powerful interests to account. And so um, we capitalized on that. We expanded dramatically our investigative resources um, and, uh, and, our, and our coverage of government and of politics. And to me, that does go to the heart of what a news organization ought to be, and what Adams, I think, talked about, which is worth talking about more, is that he did believe that, uh, we did believe, and we always have believed, that central to our purpose as a news organization is holding uh, politicians, government, powerful individuals, powerful institutions to account. Um, that is, I believe, what James Madison uh, intended when he essentially drafted the First Amendment about freely examining public characters and measures. Public characters being our politicians and measures being our policies. And so, um, and that is what Adams imagined for the press as well. And there's, there, there's sort of nothing more compelling to read over these years than the Crown officers in Boston writing back to London, um, describing the salacious press of Massachusetts and how you can't govern a colony that has six newspapers. Um, because of course, five of those newspapers are critiquing the actions of the Crown officers. Um, so it really is like, you know, it's like Charles de Gaulle, how can you govern a country with 360 cheeses? And this is, was like, you know, how, how, are, how are we supposed to get these, keep, keep these people in line when they have this press that we cannot control? And at one point, the, the governor who precedes Thomas Hutchinson, Francis Bernard, very eager to get Samuel Adams arrested and dispatched, begins to label um, the pieces that he finds objectionable from A to Z. And he's up to like, W by like the second week that he's doing this essentially. And all of those are you know, blessedly, brilliantly preserved in the British Library. Um, so you can see what he's, what he's pulling out of the paper. And what's interesting is the vocabulary is not dissimilar, but all these pieces are not Samuel Adams's. But again, people are writing under pseudonyms. Adams had a lot of them. Francis Bernard has identified Adams as um, certainly the most, the most protean um, writer in the press. And so he's often assigning credit where credit was not due with these pieces. But, but again, it's the sense of these people are writing circles around us and everyone, nine-tenths of Massachusetts, says Thomas Hutchinson, is reading the Boston Gazette. How are, we gonna, you know, how, how are we gonna get the truth through when this newspaper is getting between us and the people? And it's a riddle, obviously, that they never solve. Yeah, it's a, I mean, I think it's great that there were so many newspapers at the time. That's really <laughs> fabulous. I mean, 
I think you, in your book you called it a time-honored way to lose a fortune. Um, so, and it still is, you know. Uh, these days we say, you know, Jeff what Bezos, do you, maybe not so much. Well, not so much. I mean, before Bezos, we used to say, what do you call a billionaire who buys a newspaper? A millionaire. So, um, uh, so you know, um, Bezos doesn't seem to have affected him quite too much. He just spent half a billion dollars on a yacht. But, um, so, um, but it is still a struggling, a struggling business. And... Um, but I think people still do see it as their, as their mission to really hold, hold government to account. Can, can we talk about democracy dying in darkness for a second? Did you, is that, act, may I ask, is that a Marty Baron line? Or did you, is line. that from a Batman movie? Where, where does that come from? <laughs> <laughs> it's not from a back, uh, Batman movie. You know, I was uh, very uncertain about that line, by the way, because most companies don't talk about death and darkness in their motto. Um, <laughs> seemed like maybe that's not a good idea. I was very worried about that. Uh, but we tried, like, words with, uh, you know, light uh, and things like that, but it sounded very self-aggrandizing, and it sounded very cultish when we talked about the light. And we couldn't, we couldn't, over, we couldn't overcome that. So, and there was a lot else that we couldn't overcome. We spent actually, and I do have a chapter on this whole democracy dies in darkness thing. Um, we spent uh, two years on trying to come up with this. Bezos did not want to call it a, uh, a motto or a slogan. He wanted to call it a mission statement. And he said he wanted to come up with something that, um, that, was, that people would subscribe, not to a product, but to an idea. Uh, and I think that's really important. That was really insightful on his part and uh, demonstrated a real understanding of the relationship between uh, a, a news organization and its readers, that it's not just another product. It's actually a relationship, and you need to understand sort of what that relationship is. Um, and people needed to sort of buy into what it is we were trying to do. Um, and that's what they did. That's why we ended up with 3 million subscribers from zero uh, during that period of time, is because people felt they wanted to support what we were doing. I received God knows how many uh, emails and letters from people thanking us for what we were doing. Uh, I put them on, I had a glass walled office and I would put them facing out so that people on our staff could read them. They were so concerned after the 2016 election, many people on our staff were so concerned that none of the work they had done had any impact and that nobody was reading it and nobody trusted it. Um, that was, I mean, they were extrapolating a bit too much from what happened in that election. And, I, and so I received, the more Trump attacked us, the more letters I got, and the more our subscriptions went up. He was the best salesman for the Washington Post we ever had. Um, and, um, and because people understood that uh, we were perhaps one of the few institutions left uh, that would hold him to account. Um, they were worried about uh, what was going to happen in the Congress. They were worried about what was going to happen in the courts. Uh, and they then looked to the press and stopped taking us for granted, as I think people had done for such a long period of time. Uh, and, and when they looked at the press, essentially they looked at two organizations. They looked at us and the New York Times. Um, and uh, both of us benefited from that confidence that we would hold, that we would hold Trump to account. Uh, so as far as the motto is concerned, Oops, I slipped into the word motto. The mission statement is concerned um, that, uh, you know, he wanted it to uh, be an idea. He wanted it to uh, capture the idea, that some, something that would differentiated us from everybody else, that something that made clear that we were there in the nation's capital, uh, something, as he put it, that it would be a line that, you could, that would fit on a T-shirt, that people would wear that T-shirt. Um, and, and he said, don't be afraid of the word democracy. Um, and boy, did we struggle with that. We had like a thousand uh, options, and about 999 of them were really bad. Uh, let's, so, okay, let's, um, let's hear the top four oh, gosh, horrible ones. We love this. No, no, no. no. I, I, we're not going to go through all the bad ones, but, um, but there was roll, one. Roll. We, had, we had actually settled on one at one point. We settled on one, and... Um, we actually had a quick meeting um, in, at a hotel in Georgetown. We said, okay, we're going to finally, we're going to settle one on one. We, we have a half hour. We had like five finalists. And we settled on, and we didn't settle on any of the five that we had in front of us. We settled on something else. And, um, and so, uh, and then Bezos, um, we settled on that. He sent us a note later that night. He had gone, he had flown back home, and he had talked to his uh, then wife, Mackenzie, uh, who is a novelist, and um, she said, he said, I have bad news for you. Um, uh, she says, it's Franken-slogan. <laughs> so that was out, and we had to start all over again. And then finally, he, 
he just said, why don't we just use Democracy Dies in Darkness, which was a adaptation, it's something that Bob Woodward had said in a lot of speeches, and it was an adaptation of what a judge had uh, said at one point um, as well. It's not, it's often misrepresented as something that was said at the time of Watergate, it wasn't, but um, it is what a, a judge said, and it became, um, um, it became Democracy Dies in Darkness. So, you know, all I could think of at the time was the serenity pr prayer, you know. <laughs> um, it's like, I, I, fine, we've settled it. You know, the boss has said this, we're going to use it. He said, put it on every product. Well, it's turned out that we introduced it just after Trump took office. And, of course, Trump and all of his allies felt that it was introduced solely for the purpose of attacking him, uh, which it was not. Um, now, when Trump went out of office, I did receive a lot of letters saying, okay, you can take that off now. <laughs> uh, we didn't do that. I, I, I just want to say that we're both talking around something which we haven't named, but seems, especially from what you've just said, abundantly clear, which is something about the fearlessness that journalism requires to address the power that is in place and an institution in particular that um, one is meant to revere that isn't necessarily holding up its end of the deal. And I think, you know, those of us who read the Washington Post or the New York Times or however we consume our news, I think forget how hard it is out there. Yeah, it's really hard. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I think we were, when we were first talking about doing this panel, we were talking about the, the um, kind of the difference between writing about history and writing uh, journalism. And, um, and you had mentioned the commonly used phrase that journalism is the first rough draft of history. And as I thought about that, I thought that was incredibly generous to journalism these days. Um, it's like the first stab at history. Um, I mean, these days, because, you know, I mean, it is a 24-7 job, uh, but it's 24-7 every minute. Uh, we're writing, because of the digital world that we live in, we're producing news uh, by the minute or the seconds. Um, we, had, we had had metrics at the, uh, at the Post, for example, for our, our alerts that people sign up for to be told what's going on and people want to know right away and they measure us against other news outlets as to who's first and the metric was by the second um, we looked at our competitors um, and if they were we were listed one two three four five six whatever um, and if we were one second behind a competitor we were two if we were a minute behind we were two if we were ten minutes behind we were two so if I went if we went for two weeks by being at least three. If we were three, um, averaged over the week, uh, I heard about it from our publisher uh, that we weren't doing well enough. And why is that? We have a uh, bigger staff than our competitors, what have you. Um, so it is a, that was a punishing metric. And we labor under that, that pressure these days. Now you hope to overcome that, you do the deeper stories, you spend more time, we just continue to do investigations. Uh, but on a day-to-day -day basis and, a, and an hourly and minute-by-minute -minute basis, we're still having to deliver news to the public uh, under enormous, uh, enormous, with enormous speed and under enormous pressure. Not to mention the political pressure and all that. I, I, I just want to um, say how important local journalism is for these very reasons. And um, our media partner, the Berkshire Eagle, tries so hard to to do the same kinds of things, cover the local news, keep our, um, our elected officials and the people who work in public service honest, transparent, and how can s small town it, regional journalism possibly keep up, I mean, and possibly uh, uh, keep our, demo you know, it's important for our democracy to understand and to have a nuanced view of the issues and the 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 monetization of news it's in, it's an impossible uh, equation at this point yeah well i not to, i try not to think impossible i try to think of the possible and Slant, i think i think impossible. the i think the i think the eagle is doing a great job i'm a subscriber and i think i hope all of you are too so uh, and i think 
I think the Eagle has been has really benefited from local ownership, that being back in the in local hands, and that's that's really great. Um, and they're doing a, a really terrific job. Um, and under very difficult circumstances, and the economics are incredibly are incredibly difficult. I think um, obviously what any local news organization has to do is provide um, coverage that's of real value to the people who live in that community. Uh, and that and any local news organization has to think very seriously about what should we be doing, what, really, what, is, what is the information that people in this community are willing to pay for uh, and would really miss if we weren't, weren't here. Um, um, and they need to provide that every day. I mean, every day uh, there needs to be something that you say, that was really of use to me. Uh, I really valued that. Um, you can't, we don't, can't just sell ourselves saying, boy, you'd really miss us if we weren't around. Uh, you actually have to provide something uh, every single day that people will value. Certainly, as I mentioned, for the Post at a national level, there's more passion around national news uh, and political news than there is around local news. Um, but um, we were providing something of value, which is what I mentioned before, which is that people felt that, they're, that we were going to hold the government to account. Um, and they wanted to see that done, and they were willing to support us financially to ensure that that was done. At the local level, it's, the calculus is a little bit different, but you still have to provide value every single day uh, to the people who are your, who are your potential readers. Um, and then you have to charge them a, a fair price. And, um, and um, you know, I think the Eagle is doing that. And I, as I said, I very much support it, and I laud them for the work they're doing. Um, and uh, it is a hard, it's a, the economics are incredibly difficult, uh, but, um, you know, I think they're, they're doing a good job. Yeah. So we're going to turn the house lights up, please, and we're going to do some Q&A for both Stacy and Marty. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Right here with, Yes. No, that can you, can uh, you, oh, yeah, sure. Did the, I mentioned the personal danger that I felt after January 6th. Did that affect my decision to retire? No, it didn't. Uh, it really didn't. It affected my, um, that I would look out the window every morning before I walked out, uh, and it affected that I would look over my shoulder uh, if somebody was getting a little close, and it affected that I would walk, I would take different route. I would walk to work. Um, um, so I affected that I would change my pattern uh, that I used in walking to work, that sort of thing. Uh, but it didn't affect the decision on, on retiring. I retired for a variety of reasons. One, I was 66. I'd been uh, 20 years as the editor of a, a major news organization. Uh, it's an exhausting uh, job. As I mentioned, it's gotten even more exhausting. It's not just 24-7, it's 24-7 every minute. Um, there's almost no, no rest. You can't detach yourself from it. Um, there were, so I was, I was pretty wiped out. Uh, 2020 was exhausting in other ways too. Uh, obviously we had uh, the pandemic, we had the racial justice protests, we had the election, we had the aftermath of the election. Um, and in the midst of that, we also had some, a couple of, just a couple of uprisings in our newsroom um, at, that I was at the center of. Um, one was uh, my efforts to enforce our social media policy, which I write about in, our, in the book, um, and why I believe it's really important that we uh, have strict rules about that. Um, I'm not really in favor of a journalist at a place like the Washington Post getting on social media and expressing their personal feelings about the things they're writing about. Um, I'm not really that interested in their personal feelings. I'm interested in the reporting that they can do. Um, and that's what I think is the great value. You know, opinions come cheap. Um, uh, reporting is of real value. Uh, and I think that's what the public really expects of us. And, and, the, and then there was also the impact of the racial justice protests. There was a deep concern that there wasn't sufficient diversity in the leadership ranks of the, uh, of the Post newsroom. Uh, I did not handle that well at all, and, uh, and I regret that. It's my deep, biggest regret at the Post, and I, I write about that as well. So um, finally, I just said, look, um, I said to myself, uh, everybody has an expiration date. I think my, mine might have arrived, and I should probably uh, honor that expiration date. And I want to move on and do other things, and, um, and that's what I just decided to do. So, Joel? Uh, 
Well, I'm not a political pundit, so I'm not going to pretend to be one here uh, today. But I do think, um, the press too, I mean, I think that politicians and the press, um, we do need to get out in the country and try to understand what these concerns are. We do need to communicate we, somehow that we, we have respect for their concerns. There are a lot of people in this country who are struggling. I mean, str I mean all, in all sorts of different circumstances, every race, every ethnicity, you name it. Uh, you look at a lot of communities in this country and, and, you know, and how much they've suffered because industry has just simply disappeared um, and, um, and, and, and they're left with nothing. And they're worried about the opportunities for themselves. They're worried about the opportunities for uh, their kids. Uh, their kids are going to have to leave the community if they want to find a job. The job's not paying enough, all of that. And they have deep concerns about that. Um, you know, I may not agree with the policy solutions, I think that people like Trump and others are exploiting those feelings uh, for personal power. Um, but, and that, but we need to show that we actually care. Um, and we see this in other countries too. You know, in Venezuela, you know, you have a, the, uh, um, you know, obviously it's an autocratic government there. Uh, but the press did a really poor job there too. They, you know, just talking down to people and lecturing people is probably not the right, right way to approach it. Wendy. Stacy, your book talks so much about Sam Adams and his use of fake news. And, and of course, it was to a good end. But do you think the use of fake news, even for a good end, is a good idea? <laughs> um, it's a great question, Wendy. Um, do I think the use of fake news to a good end is a good idea? I, I think the way to frame it, other than what I said about um, we're talking about a very different world. I mean, this is a world. You know, if you look at what the what the Harvard master's theses were, that were being written in these years were, you realize what a very, very distant world this was. I mean, people are asking questions like, you know, are the American Indians, the twelve, the twelve tribes of Israel, um, you know, is do vegetables breathe? Um, is the Pope the Antichrist? You know, this is a very different world, and you have to get into the spirit of that world. Um, I would say that. It is very clear to all of us that you know truth is a casualty of war, and that the feeling at this point was there was a battle going on, and this was definitely going to be something that was going to be that was going to need to be compromised to that end. And no, I would not on any other level support it. But it's you know I think it's important to know that it's there. And for me, one of the reasons to write the book was to realize how anarchic and how provocative, and in many ways how 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 violent were these years, and how nonlinear they were, how much things go in fits and starts, and because of the tone deafness in London, how little the Americans feel they are being heard, which for me very much does resonate with where we are today, where people feel that, feel that their rights are in danger and that someone is not listening. Right here in the first row. Yeah, well, um, the, the uh, yeah, the question was that I said that it started with Trump, and I'm not sure what you mean by it uh, there, uh, but that I supposedly that the, the um, basically the, the, the hate rhetoric and things like that really, st I didn't say that it started with Trump. I said that it was, that he was the insider in chief and that his language was largely responsible for the kind of rhetoric that we're hearing today. It does have deeper roots. There's no question about it. This goes back a, a, a long period of time. Uh, there's been a deliberate effort for a long period of time to um, to denigrate a lot of the institutions and particularly to denigrate the press. Um, look, I mean, Fox News is a huge factor here. I mean, let's not kid ourselves. It's a huge factor. Uh, there was no, you know, in the past, there was no Fox News. All right. So, and now you have an, a, a media organization that day in and day out is attacking a uh, individuals, that's attacking institutions, that's attacking the so-called mainstream press, even though they happen to be the, they happen to be the largest cable out, outlet, uh, you know, they are the mainstream press, uh, is the reality of it. So, um, and, um, and, 
and they have they've made a business model out of demonization and there is money to be made in that that's why we have so many websites that that are um, and so-called news sites that are focused on demonization and focused on spreading conspiracy theories because they can make money at it um, and so that's what really what's driving it and it does have deeper roots I didn't mean to suggest that it all started with Donald Trump clearly the clearly there are deeper roots No, I, I don't. I, I'm not a political pundit, so I don't, I don't engage in those. Right here, sir. Well, it's hard to summarize that question. That basically, that we, you know, that we're not moving toward unity. Um, um, it started with the point that um, David Brooks wrote a column suggesting that uh, a lot of people in the press come from so-called elite institutions. I always like to put "so-called" in front of that word, by the way. Um, so, given that I didn't go to one of those institutions, so uh, so-called elite institutions, but. Um, and that, you know, we want diversity, but there's all this disagreement, there are lots of conflicts, we're not moving toward more unity. Uh, but Stacy could talk about, I'm not sure we've ever really had unity in this country uh, about much of, any, uh, much of anything, um, except at certain wars that we've gone to uh, overseas. But um, I don't know, give me your thoughts. I, I would agree with you there, and I would also say that when we talk about conspiracy, you know, one of the interesting things when you look at the American Revolution is how um, each side is accusing the other of the plot to overthrow America, basically. I mean, the, the British are looking at the colonies long before anyone in the colonies is talking about separation and saying they're plotting to separate, you know, they're plotting a rupture with us. And, and the colonies are looking at the British and saying they're trying, that's their word, to enslave us. And there's this real there's this diabolical language, there's this use of the word demonic. All, the language is absolutely consistent, but each side is accusing the other of conspiracy. There's a long, there's a long history of conspiracy theories in American politics. Uh, and today, even these days, in, in more modern times, I mean, I think if you pick any issue, whether it's Holocaust denialism, or whether it's vaccines causing autism, or whether it's uh, what really happened on 9-11, you'll find somewhere between 25 to 35 percent of the American public who believe in some conspiracy theory, conspiracy theory that has no basis in fact. I have a theory that we each of us believe in a conspiracy of some kind. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, yes? Right. What what role can the news play in preventing and presenting the truth about political candidates? Um, uh, that sometimes it's hard to it's often hard to discover what the truth is, and the politicians are just being marketed as if they were cigarettes. Uh, maybe they are cigarettes. Um, so, um, um, in any event, I don't agree with that premise. Uh, I've got to say, as I mentioned, we wrote an entire book about Donald Trump. We did a series of about twenty stories, something like that, about 
every chapter of Trump's life and his career in depth, and then we, as I mentioned, we went even deeper in, in this book. The idea that people didn't have information about Donald Trump, that he wasn't scrutinized, uh, I think is just, is just not true. Um, now, did we learn things after he was elected? Yeah, we learned additional things. The idea that we in the press should know everything about everybody before they get elected, I think that's an expectation that we simply can't meet. Uh, but we did a lot. And anybody who goes back and I think looks at that reporting will see that uh, it was, um, there were strong signs there of the kind of presidency that, uh, that Trump would have and the kind of person that he is. I also think it's important to remember as we talk about all this stuff that, um, you know, things change over time. I mean, I think that, look, Trump, uh, you know, um, uh, he lost the House. Uh, the Republicans lost the House in 2018. They lost uh, the presidency in 2020. They lost the Senate in 2022, in, tw in 2020 as well. And so, um, um, you know, things change. People absorb information. They make their decisions based on, on that information. And the primary source of their information uh, remains, uh, remains the media in one way or another, whether they get it directly or indirectly. We have... One more question? Yes, right here. Stacey, how did Sam Adams go from this big thorn in the side of the colonial governor to this rabble rouser who held all these secret meetings to the American's reception of the guy who just threw the tea off the boat? You mean how did he end up on the beer? Um, <laughs> I mean, the real question with Adams is how did he get, to me, is how did he get forgotten? And, and honestly, it's really hard to research a book when every time you Google the name, you get the beer. So it's, you know, it, it, don't ever try that one. Um, I, I, he's not, the, the, it's funny that you mentioned the tea. The one night of Adams' life where we are sure of his whereabouts is the night that the tea falls into the harbor because he has made a pointed effort to be conspicuously not there. Um, and that's also an interesting moment in history just because there are thousands of Bostonians on the harbor that night. Um, and the next day, interestingly, no one in Boston had noticed a thing. Um, so it's, you know, one of those extremely well attended. And this is, a, you know, this is a constant with writing history. You know, the Boston Massacre, we have so many accounts you, and then no two of them are the same. I and mean, people couldn't agree on the position of the moon. Everything is different in each of these accounts. It's a cacophony. The Boston Tea Party, thousands of eyewitnesses and not until really a generation later has anyone seen anything. And by the way, a generation later, everyone has seen, you know, everyone was participating in the tea, including Samuel Adams. It was like the French resistance of its day. You know, we were all there. We all took part. Um, he's, I think he's, he's dealt a, a lousy hand partly because he is by definition a recessive, he, he, was, he was very by nature a very recessive character. He never wrote a memoir. Um, I want to ask Marty, wanted to ask Marty if he was keeping notes of these years he's just written about. Um, Adams never wrote a memoir. He never collected his writings. He never put himself forward. He always preferred the shadows. And the shadows is where history left him for the most part. By the way, I did keep notes um, and files, um, and I thought I would have been a really bad journalist if I didn't keep track of what was happening during a historic moment in American history. With that, I want to thank everyone for coming, and please give our amazing speakers a round of applause. Thank you. One more minute, we've got a lot of thank yous because this is, first I want to thank uh, Marty and Stacy for that incredible, and Lynn for moderating, what an incredible panel. How lucky we are to have heard from them. And Marty, thank you for everything you did at The Post personally, and Stacy for your amazing books. Uh, Stacy will be signing out in the hallway afterwards in just a minute. Um, and um, I want to just, I want to thank all the speakers um, and everyone who helped with this, all the introducers, for just this amazing uh, weekend um, of, you know, just profound thinking, words, ideas, and thoughts, as was said earlier. Um, can we give everybody another round of applause? Yeah, we've covered pretty much all written forms of the narrative, from fiction to poetry to nonfiction, and now journalism, biography, and history. <clears throat> um, and so I hope you all enjoyed it as much as I did and had as many aha moments of, you know, just from, from these brilliant speakers about 
how you can change the narratives in your own lives for the better. Um, I have to thank our sponsors and our partners again, the Berkshire Eagle, Berkshire Magazine, the Bookstore and Get Lit Wine Bar, Mahawe Performing Arts Center, the Norman Rockwell Museum, the Red Lion Inn, Stonover Farm, Whistler's Inn, Wine and Spirits, and our sponsors, Cromwell Harbor Foundation, Hunter Runette and Mark Vandenbosch, Joanne Lanehart Casulo, Taryn and Mark Levitt, Hans and Kate Morris, Diana Rowan Rockefeller, Amy Davidson Sorkin, and David Sorkin, Maria Rana, Jonathan Yardley, the Berkshire Taconic Community Foundation, Merhud and Marilee Noroni, the October Mountain Financial Advisors, and Louise Hartwell White. Thank you so much to all of you for making this possible. We also need to thank all of the members of our Giving Society. Thank you so much for your support. And I would re be remiss not to say that uh, if you want to ensure that we remain in the Berkshires, uh, you should look at the inside of the uh, back page. There is a um, QR code where you can give and you can always, always reach us at staff at authorsguild.org. Um, and please consider joining the Giving Society because it ensures that you will get into every single one of the events next year. I also have to thank the Authors Guild Council and the board of the Authors Guild Foundation, and especially the WIT Committee who worked on this all year. I think the committee started last October um, and uh, to plan this amazing weekend. Richard Thomas Ford, who's here, Wendy Strothman, Hunter Runette, Will Thorndike, Maria Rana, Laura Peterson, Doug Preston, Taryn Levitt, and Roxana Robinson. I also want to thank all the staff who helped, who many of you met when you came in. Um, but most of all, I want to thank Lynn. Lynn has done an amazing job organizing this. She conceived of wit, and she curated it so beautifully. And um, I just, an example of, you know, thinking to put Stacy and Marty together for this amazing panel. So I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. This has been just amazing. I have been inspired and profoundly moved during every single one of these panels. Yeah, yeah. And then I also, I want to thank uh, Lynn and Nikki for their amazing execution. I don't think we had, everything went so smoothly. So Nikki Maniscolco, who you've all met. Um, so we're going to see you next year, fall 2024. <laughs>